Test, test. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Good.
Do the Lord say to all of you? Good morning. Um, just a <coughs> few announcements before we begin worship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, some of the people that we've been praying for, uh, updates. Selma um, needs a seatbelt, frankly. She wants to get up and do stuff. Uh, but, but thankfully, she's listening to Andy and the physical therapists. Uh, she's taking her physical therapy seriously. Uh, but she is doing well. Um, I saw her this past week. Um, she's up to two physical therapies a, a week, a day right now. So uh, hopefully sometime next week she'll be, uh, she'll be able to get back home. Uh, Wally Perjanet is doing better. He hopes to be driving again another week or thereabouts and will be back uh, among us soon. Um, Anna's mother, Mary, is out of the ICU. She had COVIDs. Uh, she was in the ICU for a little bit. She's out of the ICU. Um, they're concerned about her sodium levels, so we want to keep her in our prayers that the sodium levels can come back up to the proper levels. Um, and then uh, you'll, maybe you won't know this, but Josh is playing the organ for us today. Beth um, got a message, I think it was Thursday. Was it Thursday, Josh? Uh, Friday? I'm not sure exactly when. It might have been Friday, that her mother was not doing well. So Beth is up in Valparaiso uh, with her mother right now. Um, her mother was moved to hospice care. Um, and the latest communication I had with Beth was last night. Uh, she said her mother is getting weaker. She's sleeping more. She's not eating as much. Um, so from all appearances, it, it appears that she may soon depart this earthly life and be with the Lord. So we want to keep her mother in our prayers, but also Beth in our prayers. This has been a real challenging time for Beth to be going back and forth uh, between here and, and Valpo uh, quite a number of times. Um, that, that's all the updates on the prayer chain that I have. Uh, with regard to worship, uh, please note that we will rise on the last verse of our opening hymn, and then also the last hymn of the distribution uh, just there's some notes in there about whether Josh will stop playing or continue playing, depending on where we are with the distribution. That being said, obviously it's Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so thank you to those of you that are wearing red or reddish type colors. I appreciate that. Uh, today's a, just a wonderful day for the birthday of the church. We will begin with Luther's morning prayer, and then we'll uh, remain seated for our opening hymn until the last verse. We pray together. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn.
We pray the invocation together. O oh God the Father, graciously give us all that we need for body and soul. O oh God the Son, deliver us from sin. Be gracious to us and give us your spirit. O oh God the Holy Spirit, heal, comfort, and strengthen us against the devil and give us endless victory and resurrection from death. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will deliver our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. O oh, my dearest Lord Jesus Christ, you know my poor soul and my great transgressions. I cry out to you alone with an open heart. I am sorry that I do not have the will or intentions as I should. I fall behind daily, for I am a poor sinner. You know that I want to have good will and good intentions, but my foe strikes and leads me captive. For Christ's sake, I pray that you would forgive me and redeem me, a poor sinner, according to your divine will. Deliver me from all evil and the afflictions. Strengthen and increase in me true Christian faith. Give me grace to faithfully love my neighbor as myself with all my heart and to love him as a brother. Give me patience and perseverance in all persecution and trouble. So I come with the assurance of what you have pledged and I cry to you as the true shepherd and pastor of my soul in all my needs. You alone know how and when I need your help. Your will be done. May your name be praised forever. Amen. The good news is this. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you. And for his sake, he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, on this day you once taught the heart of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the blessing of our daily bread. We pray your blessing on these gifts of food that will be shared with our local food bank in Bedford, that through them others may also be blessed with their daily bread. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We pray together, eternal God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us your grace that we may eagerly hear the Holy Scriptures, that we may seek and find Christ in them, and that through them we may have eternal life. Help us in this, dearest God. Amen. Please be seated. Today you'll notice that we only have two scripture readings. The uh, first reading is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's the whole chapter of chapter uh, two. Um, this is the, the account of the first Christian Pentecost. It's a, a wonderful day that we have just to hear God's word. So enjoy hearing it, enjoy following it along and reading it. And uh, just a reminder, the, the evangelist Luke both wrote both his gospel according to Luke as well as the Acts of the Apostles. So Luke writes, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it is not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life you will make me full of gladness with your presence. 
Brothers, may I, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Would all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. We continue with our hymn verse. Please rise for the Alleluia verse. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart, not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me saying to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds.
Please be seated. We continue with our sermon hymn. brothers and sisters in Christ, in the name of Jesus, our resurrected and ascended Lord. Amen. Today we celebrate the birthday of Christ's church. It's the day of Pentecost. There are three points I'd like to focus our message on this morning. First, we're going to take a, a brief look at what the Old Testament festival of Pentecost celebrated. And second, we'll take a look at how the New Testament festival of Pentecost changed radically the Old Testament festival of Pentecost. And then finally, We'll consider the message that Peter preached and how what he preached is really a, a great model for us as we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And there's one theme that I, I want us to keep in mind as we go through uh, our, our lesson from the book of Acts today. This, this kind of is a, a overshadows everything that uh, I'm going to be sharing with you. And it's, uh, it's this that Jesus had to say just before he was taken up to heaven uh, to his disciples. He said, Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's a, a big blanket that goes over everything that we'll uh, talk about today. It may come as a shock to some of us, but Pentecost is not just a New Testament event. It's not just a New Testament festival. The Pentecost day that we read about in Acts was not the first Pentecost. 
The Festival of Pentecost really began as an agricultural festival in the Old Testament some 1400 or so years before Jesus. Now, after the Passover, on the first day after Passover, it was uh, the, the Israelites would bring together the first fruits of their barley harvest and offer it to the Lord in both the tabernacle as well as the temple. So Passover was connected with the beginning of the winter grain harvest, specifically the beginning of the winter barley harvest. This also marked the beginning of the winter grain harvest. Generally, you know, they plant the, the barley and the wheat in the fall and they harvest it again in the spring. So from that first day after Passover, when they start the uh, barley harvest, jump forward 50 days. The day of Pentecost marked the end of the wheat harvest. So we've got 50 days between Passover and the day of Pentecost. And during that time, they're harvesting and giving thanks and offerings for barley and wheat. The end of the wheat harvest was signified by taking two loaves of bread from the harvest of the wheat and offering that to the Lord in the temple. So these two festivals, the day of Passover and the day of Pentecost, really stand as bookends to the winter grain harvest for the Israelites. As I said, Pentecost began as an agricultural festival. However, the day of Pentecost was also a day that the Israelites commemorated the day that God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. You recall that when they left Egypt and they came across the Red Sea, it took 50 days before they got to the base of Mount Sinai. And on that 50th day, that's the day that God gave the law to Moses. So the day of Pentecost celebrated both of these events. It celebrated the end of the winter grain harvest festival, and it also celebrated the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And remember that last point, that the Old Testament Pentecost celebration celebrated the law being given on Mount Sinai. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. In Acts chapter 2, the first verse, we read this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, and the emphasis is on that word arrived. In the original Greek, the word that we translate as arrived really is better translated as fulfilled. And I'll explain why. So you should read it as when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, not when the day of Pentecost arrived. Fulfilled is the better translation than arrived because using the word fulfilled keeps the focus uh, not on us getting someplace, like you know, arriving at a destination. Rather, translating the Greek word as fulfilled keeps the focus on what Jesus came to do, what he came to accomplish, what his mission was. That is, it keeps the focus on Jesus coming to fulfill everything written about him in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Luke's focus in the book of Acts is not on the day of Pentecost arriving, not on the day of Pentecost finally getting here. Rather, Luke's focus is on Jesus fulfilling what the day of Pentecost means as it was set forth in the Old Testament. There are many connections that we can make between the day of Pentecost and the New Testament and uh, the Old Testament. We don't have time today to do, to do all that, but I want to focus on two particular things. First of all, there's this wind that swept through the house. We'll take a brief look at that. Then I'd also like to take a brief look at two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. So Luke writes, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So first, there's a wind. And secondly, that wind fills the entire house. In Hebrew, the word is ruach, R-U-A-C-H, and it can mean wind or breath or the Holy Spirit of God. And in the Old Testament, we see this ruach, this, this wind, this breath, the Spirit of God, in creation, it hovers over the waters of creation. We see this wind or breath or spirit of God drying up the waters after the flood so Noah and his family could get out of the ark. We see this wind or breath or spirit of God parting the Red Sea to lead his people to safety and deliverance from the Egyptians. And finally, we see this wind or breath or spirit of God giving life to the dry bones to, uh, that Ezekiel saw in the vision of the valley of dry bones. And now here on this New Testament day of Pentecost, we see this same exact wind or breath or spirit of God uh, coming on the disciples. And this wind or breath or spirit of God coming on the disciples is God's way of sending his powerful, miracle-performing, life-giving spirit to the apostles so that they're equipped to do what they're going to need to do in just a very short while when they proclaim the gospel to that great crowd that was in front of them that, get, that literally came from all over the known world. Now, 
not only did uh, God's Spirit come on the disciples, but we're also told that this wind, this breath, the Spirit of God, it filled the entire house. The word used here to describe God's wind or breath or spirit filling the entire house is the same word that's used to describe the glory of God filling the tabernacle for the very first time while the Israelites were wandering in the desert. It's also the same used to describe God's wind or breath or spirit filling the temple when the temple was first dedicated in Jerusalem. But today on this New Testament Pentecost, there's something very different that's going on here. Something that is fulfilling what was said about Jesus in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. On this New Testament day of Pentecost, the wind, the breath, the spirit of God is not filling a physical structure like a tabernacle or the temple. Rather, the spirit of God is now filling people's hearts. This is the fulfillment of what God said through the prophet Jeremiah, that he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Not like the covenant he made with them on Mount Sinai, where he gave them the law. Rather, the new covenant is one in which God is going to write the law on people's hearts by the power of his wind, his breath, his Holy Spirit. And this is the new covenant that Jesus instituted when he celebrated the last Passover with his disciples. This new covenant is the covenant that is made on Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai. And ultimately, it's God's people. It is all believers who are filled with this wind, this breath, this spirit of God that makes up his church. It's not limited to a physical building. It's in each and every one of us. Each and every one of us is God's temple because he dwells within us. Now, you've heard me mention Mount Zion and Mount Sinai a few times. Mount Sinai and Mount Zion are two entirely different mountains. They symbolize two entirely different things. <laughs> if you're like me though, when I was uh, much younger, for the longest time, I thought Mount Zion and Mount Sinai were the same mountain, just different words. Maybe one was Hebrew, maybe one was Greek, whatever, but that's incorrect. They are two entirely separate mountains, geographically separate. But more importantly, there's a great difference in what happened on each of these mountains that we need to be aware of. And that difference between what happened on Mount Zion and Mount Sinai helps us understand what's happening at this New Testament, at this Christian Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was the mountain where the law was given to Moses. On the morning that God gave the law to Moses in Sinai, it's described like this, there was thunder and lightning. There was a thick cloud and a loud trumpet blast. There was thick smoke, great fire, and the whole mountain shook. It was a mountain where people literally feared to go for their life because if they got too close, God said, they would die. It was a place that demanded absolute holiness and perfection. It was a place to be feared because it did not allow for any unholiness or any imperfection. It was a place that brought terror to the Israelites because it showed how sinful and unholy they were. Mount Zion, on the other hand, stands in great contrast. Mount Zion is not the mount of the law, it's the mountain of grace and mercy. Mount Zion is where the city of Jerusalem is built. Mount Zion is where the temple was built. And Mount Zion is where God dwelled among his people and most importantly, Mount Zion is the mountain on which Jesus was crucified, <coughs> just outside the gates of Jerusalem, very close to God's temple. Now, remember that in addition to uh, Pentecost being a harvest festival, the Jews celebrate the giving of the law at Mount Sinai on Pentecost as well. Mount Sinai represents the law of God, the old covenant. It represents God's demand that we be perfect, just as he is perfect. It represents something that is impossible for us to achieve. It represents the incredible burden placed on us, a burden that you and I are unable to carry, a burden that will crush every one of us because we can never keep God's law perfectly. On the other hand, Mount Zion represents the gospel, the new covenant, a covenant of grace and mercy, a covenant of the forgiveness of sins. Mount Zion represents a new covenant in which Jesus fulfilled the old covenant perfectly. Mount Zion is where the body of Jesus was given in death for you and where his blood was shed for you. Remember that when the law was given at Mount Sinai, there were signs given. There was thunder and lightning. The whole mountain shook. There was a thick cloud and loud trumpet blast. There was thick smoke and great fire. This was a warning to all that the, of the might and majesty and power and holiness of God. And people literally feared for their lives. But now think of Mount Zion 
the mountain on which Jesus was crucified. At the crucifixion, there were also signs. Dark cloud covered the sky, the earth shook, but the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus spoke and sins were forgiven and dead people were raised from the dead. Unlike the giving of the law at Mount Sinai where people feared for their lives, on Mount Zion, mercy and grace and forgiveness and new life is given. In the New Testament Pentecost, Jesus does not lay on us the burden of the law given on Mount Sinai, which is impossible to fulfill. Rather, from Mount Zion, Christ now proclaims through his disciples that he is the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. The lawgiver at Mount Sinai is the law fulfiller at Mount Zion. The New Testament Pentecost is the announcement that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law of the, that the Old Testament Pentecost celebrated being given. In Christ, Pentecost has been transformed. It's no longer a commemoration of the giving of the law, the Old Covenant. Rather, the New Testament Pentecost is now a Thanksgiving celebration in which the good news of the forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ is proclaimed to all. So, Peter preaches. He doesn't hold back what he has to say. And his concluding line, the line that got everyone's attention, is this, and it rightly should get everyone's attention. It's, he says, Would all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified? Peter indicts everyone in the crowd that was listening to him for playing a role in Jesus' crucifixion. Whether they were there at the crucifixion or not, they played a role. Since everyone is a sinner, we all have a role. Each one of us, you and me as well, individually, each one of us is responsible for Jesus dying on the cross. And you and I are equally indicted as well. Every time we have chosen to do something that God said not to do, every time we've failed to do something God has desired us to do, every time we've thought something that is contrary to God's will, every time we've said something that is not pleasing to God, every time we've chosen to give in to sin, Every time, every time, we have nailed Jesus to the cross. Peter wants everyone to know that they cannot escape the guilt of their sins because it is their sins that put Jesus on the cross. The point of Jesus' crucifixion is that everyone, everyone is guilty. Everyone needs the forgiveness of sins and that Jesus won the forgiveness of sins for everyone on the cross. So is that harsh? Is what Peter uh, saying is, is harsh to people? Yes. Is it the truth? Absolutely, it is the truth. And that's the purpose of God's law, to let us know that we have sinned. As we learn in catechism, the law of God shows us our sin. The spoken word of God cut the people to their hearts. It exposed their sin. It exposed their guilt. It exposed every thought, word, and deed. And they all put Christ on the cross. It also exposed the fact that they had no defense or justification for their sin. Their hearts and souls were cut open to reveal the deepest core of their being. All the secret sins that only they knew about and no one else knew about, they were all exposed like laundry that was hung out to dry. And it's just as if you and I were standing there with them, for we also are cut to the heart by God's law as well. And all the people, after they hear Peter, all the people can say is, what shall we do? And they're not saying, Peter, tell us what to do because there is literally nothing they can do. It, saying, what shall we do, is literally their plea for mercy. They do not know what to do because there is nothing they can do to atone for, to make up for their sins. Like the people at Pentecost, all that is left when we hear the law is to plea for God's mercy as well. There is nothing you and I can do. It is all up to God to share with us what he has done for us. So we plead for mercy, for Christ's sake. And hopefully that sounds familiar because what I've just described is exactly what we do in our confession and absolution that we always start worship with. We acknowledge that we have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed by what we've done, left undone. And we then continue by asking that God would be merciful to us. What shall we do? That he'd be merciful to us for Christ's sake because we recognize there is nothing we can do to be righteous before God. So... What shall we do? Peter's response, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And here, Peter is not telling the people what they must do. Rather, Peter is pointing them to what Christ has done for them. By the time the crowd asked the question, 
the Holy Spirit had already worked faith in their hearts and led them to repentance. And by being baptized, they and we in our baptism are joined with Christ in his death. But more than that, we are also joined with Christ in his resurrection. The result of baptism, the forgiveness of sins. And so now what? Well, just like God gave the Holy Spirit to the apostles so that others could hear the good news of the gospel in their own language, you and I have also been given the ability to speak a common language that we share with our family and friends. Not the actual language, but I'm talking here about shared experiences. Perhaps we share the experience of death of a spouse, a battle with cancer, struggles with addiction, children and grandchildren that have departed from the Christian faith, problems with our spouse and marriage. More than that, we share the most common life experience with everyone, that we are a sinner in need of forgiveness, and that we have received the forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ. That is a message that everyone needs to hear because all of us are sinners, and we all can only be saved through faith in Christ. You know and believe the mighty work that God has done for you in Christ Jesus. That's what makes you a Christian. He has rescued you from the grip of the devil. He's free freed you from the death trap that you could not pull yourselves out of. He's freed you from your sins and has given you new eternal life that is promised in Christ. These are the mighty works accomplished by Christ by his saving death and his victorious resurrection. These are the wonderful works of God by which you and I are also saved. And so it's Pentecost. We celebrate the Pentecost as a harvest festival in the Old Testament, but God has given us an opportunity to help us bring in that harvest as well. And some of us may be planters, some of us might be waterers, and others might be helpful in bringing in the harvest. But no matter what part we have in bringing people to faith, we all have a part. We are all called to be witnesses of the New Testament Pentecost. The Pentecost that sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts through faith and the forgiveness of sins by Jesus. The Pentecost that announces God's mercy and grace from Mount Zion to sinners. So take the time. Take the time this week and into the coming months. Speak to, the fam to your family and friends in their own language and share with them the good news of the New Testament Pentecost, that Jesus died to save them from their sins. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue with our offering. We rise for the offertory.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the gift of your Holy Spirit in our baptism, we give you thanks. For the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts to give us faith, to strengthen our faith, and to preserve us in faith in Jesus as our Savior and Lord until we depart this life, we praise you. Give us the boldness to be your witnesses in all that we say and do, so that others may see Christ in us, and that we might be ready and willing to share our hope in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the dead to eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the nations of the world, that the governments of all nations be a source of blessing to those who are governed, and that oppression in all forms be hindered. We pray for all who serve us through their callings, especially for those who deal with special challenges or dangers on a regular basis, including police, fire, and emergency personnel. Also, we remember at this time the military forces of our nation, those stationed both at home and abroad, whose efforts serve to defend our nation in challenging times. Be with those from this congregation who serve in our nation's military. Trevor Phillips, Joshua Rope, James Zunghengst, Nathan Adi, and Sam Wagner. Bless them as they carry out their duties, and may they be faithful witnesses of your love among those with whom they serve. Lord, in your mercy, we humbly ask your abiding presence in every situation. Bless the crops that have recently been planted. Preserve those who travel. Satisfy the needs of your creatures. Help those who call upon you in their need. Grant patience to those who suffer for your sake. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those with special concerns and needs this day, those who grieve, the unemployed and the underemployed, the chronically ill and shut in. We especially bring before you Gordon Campen, Nancy Schulenberg, Megan Dunham, Megan's brother Bryce, who has had a recurrence of lymphoma, Nancy and Russell Stroud, Ralph Anderson, Julian Wagner, Wally Rader, and Selma Clunder. We also pray for Beth's mother, who appears to be nearing the end of her earthly life. We pray that you would assure her of your love for her and bring her to yourself in your arms at her last hour. Be also with Beth and the rest of her family at this time. Grant them the peace and comfort and the hope of the resurrection. Bless them with your presence and heal them all according to your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. For the gift of life, we praise you. This week, we especially remember the gift of life that you've given to Jeff Harms, Patty Schnarr, Trevor Phillips, Joanna Schnarr, Dan Jacobson, Isaiah Acton, Timothy Zakian, and Phyllis Barnes. Thank you for the blessing that have, they have been to so many people in their lives. Bless them in the year to come. We also thank you for the gift of marriage, and especially this week, we give thanks for the marriages of Scott and Laura Stroud, and Paul and Missy Natson. Bless their marriages, keep the bond of love between them strong into the year to come. Lord, in your mercy, Merciful Father, your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, rose victorious over death and the grave. We remember with thanksgiving all your servants who trusted in Christ and now stand in your nearer presence, where all sorrows are turned to joy. Strengthen us in the confident hope of the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, that we await with joy our reunion in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and, sitting at your right hand, poured out on this day the promised Holy Spirit on his chosen disciples. For all this, the whole earth rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
We pray together. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, it is altogether true that I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but at your own command and invitation, I come to your holy table. I do not doubt your word of forgiveness, which you have spoken to me, a poor wretched sinner, and I fully and firmly believe that you have mercifully forgiven my sins for Christ's sake. Preserve me in faith and in unbroken communion with you. Amen. We pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. Body of Jesus, given death on the cross for you. Shed on the cross for you. The forgiveness of sins. The true blood of Jesus shed on the cross for you. For the forgiveness of your sins. It is true body, true blood of the Lord.
We rise and continue with the last verse of our hymn. give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
We pray together. Dear God, as you sent your Holy Spirit on thousands on the day of Pentecost, we pray that you would continually send us your Holy Spirit, that he may take the word we have heard and write it in our hearts, that we grasp it, believe it, and find our joy and comfort in it forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Depart in peace. Serve the Lord. As surprising as it is, I don't have any announcements. So mark this day down on your calendar. Pastor didn't have any announcements. Greg? Andrea?
the name just went out of my head. I just want to remind the Vine Committee members, there's a bunch of you here, that we have a meeting Wednesday at 4.30. Oh, uh, one more. Uh, reminder, council meeting is not this Thursday, next Monday on the 13th. That's good, because I'll be out of town. Um, so you should have an insert in your bulletin about pictures. We had pretty decent turnout for pictures, but we're, we're, we're well short of getting everybody. So we now have three options. On Thursday the 16th, you can come from 5 to 7. There's a sign-up sheet in the back on the table. You can make an appointment in Timeless Photography. She's uh, right next to the Times Mail downtown, and she'll catch any time. There's not a big rush to get this done, but you know, we don't want to be in... October or something, or you can email them to me. My email's on the the insert, and uh, if I don't see your name or hear from you, then I'll be calling you <laughs> <laughs> at all sorts of the time of the evening. I'm just decent. So I hope to see your picture. And somebody brought a 2014 uh, directory, and I thought it looked pretty nice. So if somebody wants to loan me one of those, I can show it to the photographer because this would be the first time she's done this. I think she'd do a fantastic job, but I liked the layout of the one that I saw this week, so that's, that's my open thing. Anything else? Okay. Um, oh, Manuel. <laughs> Thank you. I have my picture taken. Now, do I have to do anything else? No, nope, you're good. No. Okay, it goes automatically yep. to you. Okay. And she does offer packages if you want, you know, if you bring your family and want pictures and that's an option, but it's not required. Eggs in the back, help yourself. Oh, eggs are in the back, help yourself. And just as a, a way to encourage you, uh, I might be showing my age, but those of you that fail to get a picture taken, we'll just insert a picture of Alfred E. Newman. <laughs> those of you that are older, you, you know who he is. So we'll just put that right there for you where your beautiful portrait should be. I'll greet you in the back. <laughs>